So in Canto 12, we descend into the seventh circle, the first of these rounds in Lower Hell. And it actually seems quite a straightforward canto in some ways. The main feature, to cut to the chase, is a river of boiling blood, within which are boiled those whose blood boiled in life. They are those who committed violence against their neighbours. Seems relatively straightforward to understand if grim now. And indeed Dante himself um, keeps a cool head throughout this canto. It's as if this isn't a trouble that traps his soul. He himself is not inclined to the kind of violence that might destroy a neighbour. And so he's able to see and understand relatively clearly throughout this canto. If you like, it's a first step into the lower reaches of hell that's, relatively speaking, straightforward. But there's always lots of details. And I think part of the message of this canto is that when things seem clear, keep pushing, keep asking, because there's always in God's creation more to see, more to understand, nuance and detail that begins, that, that greatly expands what seemed obvious when it first met the eye. So they find themselves, as they move into the seventh circle, um, clambering down a very steep slope that um, has lots of rocks that have been displaced. And they realise it's a kind of landslide. And in the poem, it reminds Dante of a famous landslide that uh, where land slipped from the top of a mountain right down into the valley. So it's a very dramatic example of a landslide. Um, we get the first little um, uh, indication of another theme that's going to trot through this canto, which is that Dante can move the rocks. Um, he has to be careful as he descends the landslide. He's got this corporeal side um, and so has um, a physical impact in this strangely psychophysical zone. We'll come back to that a little bit more, one of these running themes that I find really fascinating. So they look down the landslide and they see at the bottom what's described as a horror that no eye should have to see. Um, and this is the Minotaur, who is the sort of bestial child of the queen to King Minos on Crete, Queen um, Pasiphae. And she famously dressed herself up in a wooden box um, that looked like a cow and was mounted by the bull and gave birth to the Minotaur, this half bull, half human creature um, that King Minos then put into the labyrinth and used to kill those whom he wanted to suffer a particularly terrifying end. So. It's here, I think, partly because it signals in the sort of fairly straightforward allegorical way um, that we're in a ring now to do with those who are subject to bestial violence. Um, remember, it's different from just straightforward anger, um, which uh, can be turned and used in various ways. Um, although, as we saw in the high reaches of hell, not always. Um, we're now into a kind of um, bestial anger that where um, the blood is boiling, the animalistic instincts have completely taken over. Um, and that's so with the Minotaur, um, whom they approach. Um, and Virgil quite easily is able to use his insight um, to confuse the Minotaur. Essentially, he says to the Minotaur, you think Dan you've seen a living man in Dante, which the Minotaur had spotted and started to rage about. Um, but Virgil um, says, you think the Duke of Athens, i.e. Theseus, is come again to slay you. You remember the story that Theseus finally frees Athens from um, the tribune that's required each year for the Minotaur, when they had to send seven men and seven women um, to Crete um, to feed to the Minotaur. Theseus um, allocates himself as one of the seven and with Ariadne, um, who's the Minotaur's sister, um, lays the thread into the labyrinth so can go in, kill the Minotaur and then find a way out again. So the Minotaur um, goes into even more paroxysms of rage, thinking that Theseus, the one who killed him, um, is approaching him again. Um, you know, this is really blind rage that's being depicted in the Minotaur. 
Um, he doesn't see any more than his own past, and particularly the past that's attracted him now for all eternity. Um, the story goes that when he knew Theseus was killing him um, and he'd been defeated, um, he flew into even more violent rage and so died in a kind of hellish torment that has now led him to this point in hell. Um, it's quite a common theme in um, the, the Divine Comedy and in fact in other spiritual texts that um, the mood that seizes you at death um, is going to have quite a big bearing upon where you find yourself, what you're able to experience and see after death. Um, we'll return to that, just sort of put it out there for now. Um, certainly the case for the Minotaur. But what is also sort of doubly tragic about the Minotaur's fate is that the landslide is all around him and he hasn't thought for a moment to ask what the landslide's about. He's so trapped in the past that he can't really see anything that's happened since. He can't see um, Dante approaching him as Dante, not Theseus. Um, he can't also see that the landslide might in a strange way be a sign of hope, even in these deeper domains of hell. And Virgil and Dante have a conversation about the landslide. And there is some discussion in the commentators on um, the Divine Comedy, what the landslide's about. Um, some say it's um, the result of the earthquake that follows the crucifixion of Jesus, um, as um, it's said in Matthew's Gospel. But I actually prefer the interpretation that this is the landslide um, which happened when Christ harrowed hell. Um, in this canto it's left a bit ambiguous what Virgil's referring to. Um, but I prefer the idea that this is the landslide that happened when Christ harries hell um, and rescues um, those from limbo, as we heard earlier on. Um, and as it were, the effect of Christ coming into hell um, is felt all the way through hell, right into the deeper reaches, which is both an indication of um, the terror of the approaching Christ to those who are condemned, um, they just see a kind of divine judge who's going to condemn them forevermore. But it's also this sort of slightly less obvious hint that Christ's power can reach all the way through hell. And who knows quite what that's going to bring about in the future? Is it going to bring about a deeper rescue too? Um, that's what I'm wondering whether we're, as readers, being asked to sort of prophesy, asked to foretell by these details. And it's something that the Minotaur doesn't go within a million miles off in his rage and in fact he falls into such a profound rage that he starts gnawing and eating himself and that's actually really quite straightforward for Virgil and Dante to get around him and there's more to this discussion I like the idea that it's the harrowing of hell rather than the crucifixion too because this says something um, about how a lot of what we're experiencing hell is natural um, it's an extension of reality, if you like, not a sort of supernatural place that's somehow very disconnected to our experience of life in the here and now. So the harrowing of hell and the earthquake, um, as it were, pushes in front of it, happens because Christ, the Logos, the creative principle that runs through all the cosmos, that presence is felt and it causes chaos in hell um, where it can cause order um, in other parts of the cosmos, noticeably, notably in heaven. So it's a more naturalistic, realistic explanation than the crucifixion, which is this kind of more miraculous intervention, um, turning things around in a kind of instance. There's a place for that. Although we're going to see, too, that the crucifixion itself is radically re-envisaged, but not for a long time yet. So this idea that the harrowing of hell and the earthquake and so on is... Um, is a natural part of the realism of what Dante is trying to convey. Um, and this links too to how he moves the rocks. Um, it's saying, um, it's giving us these little details um, that make us think, you know, we're not in a completely unusual terrain here. It's got a kind of physics, you might say. Um, and it's not our everyday physics, but nonetheless, there is a kind of logic and order to it. Um, and so it draws us in that little bit more to the realism, to the fact that this isn't just a kind of fantasy, but is an, a work of imagination that's really trying to invite us to move into um, a greater sense of reality. 
That's also implied by another set of comments that Virgil makes about the landslide. Um, he interprets um, it through the ancient Greek philosopher Empedocles. Um, he uses rather a nice expression um, when he says, um, the landslide came about when the universe felt love. And what he's referring to is um, the great Greek um, pre-Socratic philosopher Empedocles' idea that um, at the kind of highest level, the universe is shaped by two contrary forces. On the one hand, there's love that brings order and harmony and purpose. And then on the other hand, there's chaos that brings disorder and disharmony and disarray. And Empedocles envisages this happening in kind of great cosmic cycles, um, in a sort of upswing, love whole sway, and then there's a turn and chaos takes over once again. Um, and, you know, Dante's respecting that view by giving it voice here. But what he's also, I think, intimating is that Christianity extends this view of love and shows that love actually is the end of all things. It's not just part of a cycle, um, uh, again, which we're going to see most fully in paradise. Um, so he's gathering and taking up the wisdom that's uh, already known and extending it. And that's his, as it were, force of flight. That's his direction of travel. That's what the descent, as much as the ascent, um, invites us to consider. And it's one of the ways in which the Divine Comedy you know, isn't just an illustration of Christian truth, isn't just a set of allegories that can be neatly um, put into their place. You know, like these are the violent people um, who are violent against their neighbours and so therefore boil in blood sort of period. No, there's a lot more going on and this sense that um, we're being invited to sort of extend our view um, of reality as well. Um, where will love um, take us? Where will love end up? Where will even the Christian dispensation, I think, is sort of partly being intimated. Might it even be exceeded? Is there more to know? I think that comes about in paradise, but we're going to come to that at another point. For now, um, they continue past the Minotaur um, and they see the centaurs um, who are guarding um, the river of boiling blood. They see the centaurs first. Um, they're kind of guarding um, the river. Um, and they're interesting creatures to have at this point. Again, they're kind of half man, half beast, so it's sort of appropriate that they are visible um, in this domain. Um, it's very much part of the spirit and character of this domain um, for the half bestial, half human to be seen, and so the centaurs are there. Um, they're also um, the creatures of violence, um, in this case a kind of violent divine rape um, in heaven. Um, they're called the centaurs, because the first part of their um, name, the scent, refers to a hundred. Um, there were said to have been a hundred sons born of this divine rape, uh, and the Torbit, the orbit, is aura from heaven. So they're the kind of the hundred from heaven born of the divine rape. Um, you know, they're also um, they capture something of um, how um, a kind of superhuman strength can enter a body when violence is at play. Um, you know, people report even discovering a kind of excess of strength um, when either they're being violent or they're subject to violence. They do things which they didn't know they could. And the centaurs kind of embody this um, with their horse strength and human heads. Um, but they're also differentiated um, in an interesting way. Um, we're told that um, Nessus is there, one of the centaurs, um, and he died. Um, by taking revenge on Hercules. The story goes that he was killed by Hercules in one of Hercules' labours. Um, and um, I'm just checking um, Hercules' wife's name there, um, De Janeira. Um, uh, as he's dying, Nessus gives a cloak to De Janeira, um, which he's soaked in his own blood, which is poisonous. Um, and he tells De Janeira, um, if you give this cloak to a man, they will fall in love with you. So later on, long after Nessus is dead, he has his revenge because Hercules does start to fall in love with another woman. Um, De Janeiro, his wife, gives him the cloak given to her by Nessus. Hercules puts it on and indeed the poison takes its effect and Hercules dies. So Nessus seems like he's got his revenge, but of course um, his, his revenge after his own death perpetuates his own condemnation um, in eternity. Um, so his violence against Hercules leads him to ending up here. 
Um, it's, I unpick this slightly because this is one of the moments in the Divine Comedy where we're getting names of centaurs and we're going to get some names of humans as well. And I think this is part of what Dante is doing to try to help us to dis differentiate between different kinds of violence against neighbour. Um, you remember that we had sort of strings of names when we were in the circle of the lustful um, all that time ago. Um, and they were there as a purpose, not just to say there's many people here, but to differentiate between different kinds of lust. And so here we're getting this sense of differentiation between different kinds of violence against neighbours as well. Um, another centaur is named when we're here, um, and that's the centaur, yeah, Follus. Um, and um, Follus's story is that he um, died by dropping one of Hercules' poisoned arrows on himself. He was careless, you might say, um, in his violence. Um, and uh, his rage sort of overtook him and uh, um, he died as a result. So, you know, different kinds of violence. Um, when they uh, look into the river of blood, they see others again, they see tyrants, they see murderers, they see people who, who have killed while they were thieving. Um, a whole string of in individuals um, from Alexander the Great to various figures of Dante's own time. And again, this is not just saying there are lots of people in this circle of hell, watch out, you can commit violence against neighbours too. But um, it's asking us to sort of understand how this different kind of violence can come about in order that we're equipped with the wisdom that not, that might inculcate within us. The centaurs are equipped with bows and arrows and they use those arrows to keep the condemned in the river of boiling blood. Um, again, it's a, a lovely little sort of twist, um, one of those sort of details that tells you that a little bit more. Um, I think the bows and arrows might be a kind of perversion of Cupid's bow, um, dart that um, he fires to make people fall in love. Um, remember the centaurs are the, um, the product of violent rape, violent love, and so they have now violent bows and arrows um, that keep condemned in their place. Now Virgil is being smart in this canto and his words are having effect and in order to get round the centaurs um, he um, uses his wisdom again and he calls particularly to Chiron one of the centaurs um, who he recognises um, and it's a smart move because Chiron is slightly different. Um, he too was born of a violent rape um, but um, his father was Saturn the god and it's given him a kind of reason, a kind of wisdom, which he's held on to, um, even in hell. And so Virgil knows that he um, can be talked to, he can be negotiated with, and that means that he'll also be the leader of the other centaurs, because that's what wisdom enables you to do. It enables you to, as it were, rise above um, the collective, um, disorientated, chaotic instincts of the masses. Um, so he calls for Chiron, and, and Chiron comes forward, um, and... Um, does a very fascinating thing and it's said that he picks up one of his arrows and separates his beard with it and then says how he's noticed that Dante is moving the rocks as he walks. He's thinking you might say and in that thinking he himself um, is, at war, is not just in the psychological state of hell that the others are in but he too is able to move in a slightly different way signaled by um, his separating of his beard I think. Um, so we're being asked again to kind of imaginatively um, enter into this psycho-spiritual, sorry, physico-spiritual um, zone um, and it's suggested you know that um, it's kind of wisdom and thought that enables you um, to keep your mind about the state, about this um, this domain, um, which, um, you know, Chiron has to some degree. Um, uh, we're also told um, that um, Virgil asks Chiron to give them a centaur um, to ride on, um, because Virgil knows that in order to get across the river of boiling blood, they're going to have to cross at the ford, um, and that means that uh, they're going to have to need, they're going to need a ride, um, and Chiron, sure enough, um, commands Nessus um, to give them a ride. Um, but Virgil in the request says that part of the reason is that um, Dante can't fly, he's not a spirit, so he can't just as it were, fly over the river and avoid the, boil the boiling blood. Um, and again, it's one of these details which I love because it's saying this is not just a dream, you know, everyone knows that you can fly in dreams. Um, 
Dante can't fly in hell. Again, there is a kind of physics that he's got to obey. So they need the ride of Nessus. Um, and um, they're in a different state. It's the realism of the Divine Comedy, as it's sometimes called, inviting us to extend our appreciation of what we take to be a reality as we contemplate imaginatively um, the, um, the Divine Comedy. So they get their ride from Nessus, you know, God's word um, can control even um, uh, the, the violently deranged um, centaurs uh, down here um, in the lower reaches of hell. Um, and it's said that they take a ride right around um, the circle of the river that forms, that matches as well the circle of hell that they're in. Um, and, you know, it's rather extraordinary sights that Dante doesn't quite paint himself. Again, I think he's sort of saying to us, um, you know, use your minds, we can use our minds in this canto. Um, it's not sort of completely overwhelming, it's pretty grim, um, but uh, imagine um, the sight of a centaur with two humans on his back, um, you know, quite extraordinary. They ride around 180 degrees of the river, there's just one character um, amongst the many that they see um, that I wanted to draw attention to, and that's uh, Guy de Montfort, um, who they spot, and it's a nice little moment for English readers of the Divine Comedy, even though it's a reference in hell, um, because the Thames is named. Um, and the story there is Guy de Montfort, um, in Dante's own time in the 13th century, had taken revenge by killing his cousin, even as his cousin was at mass. The story goes that as the host rose at the mass, Guy de Montfort um, killed his cousin. Um, you know, particularly... Um, disturbing account of violence against neighbour that has um, led to him being in hell and it's said that his cousin's head still drips um, into the river Thames um, and the, the, you know there's a kind of comparison there being made that the blood that in the upper world that drips into the Thames calling out for vengeance or justice um, is um, as, as it were just a sort of shadow of the blood in which the murderer now boils down in hell. Um, so they find their way to the ford um, and um, cross it um, and there they're left on the other side of the river of blood. Um, Nessus the centaur crosses back um, and we're left wondering quite what they're going to encounter next. And I think it is going to be a tough scene, particularly for us today.